So last time we uh, started studying this new phenomenon, it was a bit uh, a bit messy. So I, I gave you this result that uh, SL2Z is not interaminable, but we actually proved this in a very strange and roundabout way because we proved something much stronger, which I'll which I'll discuss today. Um, now I told you that I would uh, prove this lemma. So we proved. Uh, what did we rigorously prove? We rigorously proved that uh, if we took this measure mu, any measure without atoms mu, and any sequence in the group, then there's a subsequence such that this mu converge to a Dirac uh, and the weak, weak star topology. And I claim that from this we get a slightly stronger fact, uh, or this is the fact we actually use, that um, if we take mu and first act on it by an element of the group G, and we take any infinite sequence, then this converges weak star to zero. So in other words, we don't have to pass to a subsequence uh, or anything for, for this statement. Uh, so I'll go ahead and prove why this is the case. Uh, and then, um, yeah, and then we'll discuss this phenomenon. So what did we show last time? So let me go ahead and prove that little enough. So last time, we showed that uh, the action of SL2Z uh, acting on real projective space, uh, the space of lines in R2, uh, so this is a convergence action. So, i.e., let me define convergence actions. This is what we showed, but it has a name and it's called convergence actions. Uh, i.e., so we have an action on a compact house door space, and this is a convergence action if, uh, whenever we have some sequence uh, in the group, so this is gamma and gamma such that Tn converges to infinity. Uh, so then there exists a subsequence, C sub n sub k, and uh, two uh, points a and B in this set K. So this is going to be K here, a compact Hausdorff space, actually a compact metric space since I'm taking sequences, probably be a metric and metrizable. Uh, if we take this compact metrizable space K, there exist two, two points A and B such that we have this north-south dynamics. So such that um, we have T and K of x converges as k goes to infinity to b for all x in k except possibly at the point a. So a could maybe be like a fixed point or something for a subgroup or something like this. Uh, but this is the definition of a convergence action and we showed last time that the action of SL2z or any lattice or any discrete subgroup of SL2r the action on real projective space is a convergence action. In fact, this is, uh, so there's some literature on convergence actions and uh, the literature is, is basically trying to generalize this, uh, the phenomenon of north-south dynamics uh, in this particular example. Right? So this is kind of the model example to think about. Uh, and then I said, uh, so we noticed that uh, this in particular implies that equivalently, Uh, so if any points, if it takes any points, uh, then we can say that uh, for any uh, neighborhoods A of A and B of B, we have that TK, T sub N sub K, When we apply it to the complement of A, 
of line decay take away A can be moved so that it contain is entirely contained in B, and this is for K large enough. So it can take any the complement of any neighborhood of uh, of A and move it entirely in one neighborhood of B. And we saw that as a consequence of this, we get the therefore if um, uh, yeah, so that's yeah. I'll we'll say that. So therefore, if we have any measure mu, a probability measure on K, so then we get that T N K times mu. This sequence, since we push everything outside of any arbitrarily small neighborhood of A, and we push it all the way as close as we want to B, we get that this converges to some alpha times the Dirac measure at B plus one minus alpha times the Dirac, actually let me, yeah, so one minus alpha times the Dirac measure at A, and where we can calculate what is this one alpha and one minus alpha, uh, so where one minus alpha is exactly just the measure of the singleton of A. Uh, so in particular, this means, um, uh, mm, actually, I don't, I don't want to say this because of course, it, I, no, let me not say this. This doesn't quite fall within this, but what it does say is that this converges, this is how I'm going to use it. So this converges to the Dirac mass at the singleton B um, if mu of A mu of A is equal to zero. So if we don't have an atom at A, then we certainly collapse everything to B. Right? This is how I'm going to use it. In particular, if you have a measure which has no atoms, then this will be the case. So uh, yeah, so I claim, let's write this as a little lemma, that in fact, if we have a convergence action, and we have a probability measure uh, without atoms, So there are no points, no singletons with positive measure. Uh, so then whenever we have a, a sequence, T, N, R, and gamma, such that they converge to infinity, uh, and whenever we take any gamma and gamma, uh, so then T, N, mu minus T, N, gamma, mu, Converges weak star to zero. So that's the lemma that you don't need to pass to sub subsequences to get this. Uh, that's fine. Uh, and let's go ahead and prove this. It's an easy lemma. So let's prove by contraposition. We'll suppose that this doesn't happen. Uh, so suppose that for some sequence and some element gamma, this doesn't. Converge to zero weak star. Well, the weak star topology is by definition the dual, uh, the topology, the, when I say weak star, I mean in the, viewing this uh, in the space of the dual space of continuous functions. So this just means that there's some continuous functions such that integrating with res respect to this measure doesn't go to zero. So therefore, there exists F, a continuous function on K, such that, uh, say, the limb soup as n goes to infinity of the integral of f d mu uh, d t n mu minus the integral of f d t n gamma mu an absolute value is greater than or equal to sum c which is greater than zero. So it exists x and there exists uh, and c greater than zero such that all right. Hey, so I'm sorry. Uh, yes. So the, this condition, so when you say Tn goes to infinity, does that mean that the collection of Tn's, like, they are not finite? 
Uh, yes. So when I say, when I write TN goes to infinity, so this, and this is whenever I write this uh, for any set even, uh, all I mean by this notation is that uh, for every F in gamma finite, there exists N such that TN is not an F for N greater than four N. That's what I mean by TN goes to infinity. So okay. it escapes every finite set. Right, and more generally, if we have a topological space, I might write the same notation to mean it escapes every compact set. Um, okay, but here I just mean that it escapes every finite set. Uh, okay, because of course you could take, say, the constant sequence, and then this clearly doesn't converge weak star to zero. So uh, other than taking the constant sequences, or when you have subsequences, which are constant sequences, that's the only, that's the only uh, thing that can happen. All right, so now we take this infinite sequence uh, tending to infinity, and we get that uh, by contraposition, we have that the, this difference is greater than C uh, for some positive number. Uh, but now we can take a sub subsequence and get rid of the lim su. So taking a subsequence, uh, we can assume uh, this is a limit. All right, but now here we have a sequence and now we can take a further subsequence and assume that uh, that both that this measure and this measure converge uh, using the convergence property right here, this, this fact, right? So taking a further subsequence, So this one I'll actually name T and K. Uh, we have that T and K mu converges to the Dirac function for some B uh, because mu has no atoms, but also gamma times mu has no atoms. So also uh, T and K gamma mu converges to the same thing. But then this means that their difference converges weak star to zero, or in other words, both of these. So therefore, we get that this F D T N mu minus F D T N gamma mu. So this just converges to F at B minus F at B, which is zero, right? Which would give a contradiction. So that finishes that little one. All right, so this was, uh, this proved that little lemma that we proved last time, and this is true for any convergence action. Uh, the other thing we uh, noted, so here's the definition. So definition, a group gamma is a convergence group if it has a convergence action uh, gamma acting on k such that uh, this action has no fixed points so that such that this action um, does not fix a point or a pair of points. This action does not fix a point or a pair of points. And this is for infinite groups. A point or a pair of points. Um, so, this action does not fix a point or a pair of points. So the reason why the definition is like this, because uh, that means that, um, of course, that's usually fairly easy to check. Like with our example, uh, acting on real projective space, there are the stabilizer subgroups of real projective space are very explicit. And so you, if you have a subgroup, you can check that if it's not virtually abelian, 
then it's not going to fix a point or a pair of points. But because it's a convergence action, fixing a point or a pair of points is equivalent to having an invariant measure. Right? So equivalently, uh, the action on K does not have an invariant measure, probability measure. Right, because we saw, so this is an infinite group. So if we have any invariant probability measure, then we take any infinite sequence and we take a subsequence and we converge to a Dirac function, except, uh, you know, possibly if the A had an atom, you might converge to a Dirac function of, uh, you know, two points, a convex combination of two points. So in either case, you either would pre preserve this point uh, because this had to be your mu, or you would get a convex co or convex combination of two Dirac masses, and then you would maybe preserve the pair. Right. So as soon as you don't have a point, uh, as soon as you don't fix a point or a pair of points, then there's no invariant probability measure at all. And and so this is the definition of a convergence group. Um, okay. So one so some in the literature. Uh, so I like this definition of convergence groups, but in the literature, you might say uh, even if uh, that they just have some convergence action, and they might call them non-elementary if they don't fix a point or a pair of points. So that's just something to look for in the literature. Uh, but let me give you one example of a convergence action which is not coming from a convergence group, and that is you could consider the integers uh, acting on the one-point compactification of the integers, um, where they fix uh, the point at infinity. So this is a perfectly nice convergence action. If you think about it, if you take any sequence in the integers, uh, then you know you can push everything to some neighborhood. In fact, you'll can you'll push everything to infinity. Uh, so this is an example of a convergence action but it does fix a point. So the integers, uh, you know, this fixes a point, the convergence. Uh, if you want maybe a, a slightly less trivial example, you can consider the infinite dihedral group. And this acts on the integers union, uh, the two points at infinity. So where again, the, the infinite dihedral group is just an index two extension of, of the integers where the, the order two element just flips, um, just uh, takes everything to its negative. Uh, so then this again is a convergence action. This action does not fix a point, but it fixes the pair of points, negative infinity and positive infinity it, it fixes. Uh, so this is a convergence action. But these are elementary convergence actions, so these are not particularly interesting for us. Uh, in fact, notice because it's equivalent to not fixing a point or a pair of points is equivalent to not fixing a measure. This means in particular that amenable groups are never convergence groups because amenable groups fix measures on every compact house door space. This is one characterization of amenability. So uh, these two groups here are amenable and they are definitely not convergence groups. But we showed last time uh, that any subgroup of say SL2Z that is not virtually abelian is, is a convergence group. Uh, okay, and then the proposition I outlined last time, let me make it more explicit. And that is that uh, if gamma is a convergence group, Uh, actually, let me give, let me make this a bit more systematic. So let's uh, give a definition first. Definition, a group gamma is properly proximal if there does not exist a left 
gamma invariant state on L infinity of gamma mod C naught of gamma. So if we take L infinity of gamma, take the quotient by C naught of gamma, this is a perfectly nice abelian C star algebra. And gamma acts uh, on this by both left multiplication and right multiplication on L infinity. Uh, so we can look at the right, uh, so I don't know the best way to denote this, I'll do gamma sub R. So we're gonna look at the invariant uh, functions uh, for gamma acting on this space by right multiplication. And when we do that, we still have a left action. So we have a left action of gamma on this abelian C star algebra. And we just ask that there's, um, there does not exist a gamma invariant state on this. So this is the definition. Uh, hopefully this seems clear. So this is, um, you know, so this is the set of uh, right gamma invariant uh, functions in L infinity of gamma. Uh, actually, it, it might be if you don't like taking the quotient by C naught. So this is uh, taking the quotient by C naught is just kind of a trick to to rule out things like an interminability conjugation on the identity. Um, so what you can do is you can look at uh, equivalently. If we define, uh, if we consider, let me call it script A, this is the set of all F and L infinity of gamma, such that F minus right translate by F is in C naught of gamma for all T and gamma. So then this is a C star subalgebra of L infinity. So this is a C star subalgebra of L infinity gamma. And again, the action of the left, the action coming from left multiplication of gamma on L infinity will preserve the C star algebra. And so we get an action of gamma on the C star algebra and we can say that uh, so gamma is properly proximal if and only if uh, there does not exist a gamma invariant state on a a left gamma right the action here is a left multiplication a left gamma invariant state on here um, yeah, so the group should be infinite, uh, so an infinite group, yeah. If the group was finite, then L infinity would be the same as C naught, and so I'd just write the scalars here. That wouldn't be so interesting. So an infinite group is properly proximal if there does not exist an invariant state. Uh, how, how do we see that the existence of an invariant state on A is equivalent to this C star algebra that we've given up here? Uh, that's pretty, so why is this equivalent? And that's uh, because if you consider, uh, since we have this natural map from A to this quotient space, But also any function in the quotient space, uh, if you have a function on the quotient space, you can always lift it to some function on L infinity. Uh, and the fact that it's right gamma invariant exactly tells you that the lifting, right, there's an essentially unique way to lift it modulo C, C0. So, uh, so what I mean is that this is actually a surjective, surjective map. And, uh, and, so, uh, and so if there's a left invariant state here, then of course you get a left invariant state here by composing it with this map. 
But also if there's a left invariant state here, well, then you also have C naught, right? So the kernel of this map is exactly C naught, right? So if this is pi. So the kernel of this not pi is exactly C naught of gamma. So if you had a left invariant state on A, then C naught of gamma would have to be zero, the state would have to give, be restricted to zero on C naught of gamma. Why otherwise we could restrict it to C naught of gamma and get a left invariant positive uh, linear functional there. But gamma is infinite, so there's clearly no left invariant uh, linear functionals here because right, it'd have to be constant on left, left cosets, uh, which would be everything. So therefore, if we have any state, right? So if we have phi uh, on a, a gamma invariant state, so then we get the phi restricted to C0 of gamma is identically equal to zero, and hence we can quotient it out. So we we therefore get that V defines a state on M infinity gamma mod C0 of gamma. All right, so either way, if you like the quotient, this is a nice compact definition, or this C star algebra maybe has a little bit nicer because it's, con it's actually contained in L infinity. You don't have to take the quotient but it's the same notion, uh, both of these. The existence or non-existence rather of an invariant state is, is proper, properly proximal. Uh, and then the proof I gave you last lecture was an outline of the proof that in fact, every convergence group is properly proximal. So let's make that explicit now. So here's the theorem. And if gamma is a convergence group, so then gamma is properly proximal. All right, so let's give a proof of this now. And I kind of, so I outlined the proof last time, the, or it was kind of in there last time. Um, so the idea is that from this convergence action, we actually get a completely positive map from the function space into this uh, C star algebra A that I've written here. And so if we had an invariant state here, we'd be able to pull it back to give an invariant measure. So this is the idea. So let me make this explicit. So let's suppose that we have this convergence uh, is a convergence action without uh, invariant measures. Or let me do it by contraposition. So I'll just take any convergence action. So we'll suppose gamma is not properly proximal. We'll take any convergence action, and then I'll prove to you that it has a, a fixed point or a fixed pair of points, or equivalently, that it has a, an invariant measure. So, how do we do this? We define this map B, I'll call phi, and this is going to map continuous functions from K to L infinity of gamma, and this is going to be defined by phi of a function. Oh, so we're going to fix, uh, fix, fix mu a probability measure, any probability measure without atoms. And then we're going to define this map phi, and it's just going to be defined by phi of f at t is just going to be equal to f uh, compose uh, T inverse, probably I want D mu, or equivalently, this is the integral of F D T mu. 
you know, this is what I want. Uh, so what do we notice about this map? Well, the first thing to notice is that this is left equivariant. So we have the action of, uh, so note that we have this action of gamma on continuous functions, which is uh, pre-composition by T inverse. So if we have this, if we look at V of F compose S inverse, at t. So this is the integral of f compose s inverse t inverse d mu, which is exactly the same as v of f, and then we have uh, t s inverse. So this is at t s. Uh, I don't want the right action. I want the left action. So let's see. What did I do wrong? Um, Okay, probably it's my definition here. So if we do that, S inverse T, S inverse T, which is just left action, the left shift by S of P of F at T. Right, so we see that this map phi I've defined is left equivariant where on the C of K you have this action and on L infinity you have this left shift action. So this is equivariant. The other thing to notice is that um, if we, instead of doing the left action, if we consider the right action, so also if we consider the right action of S, by phi of f, and we apply this to t. Well, now this is phi of uh, f at t s, which is the integral by our definition. This is the integral of f d t s mu. And so what do we see? We see that therefore, if we look at the right action by s phi of f, and now we subtract. Professor, shouldn't there be inverses according to our definition? Uh, so there because should be. You I'm probably screwing up inverses so somewhere, that's for sure. So this. Uh, um, so in the top line, when you have written the definition f composed with t d mu, that should be an inverse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you're right. Uh, so this is, that's still fine. So then this is. S inverse T inverse. Wait, something's uh, something's off here. Uh, probably it's. So I did something wrong. I wanted. I was hoping to get a left equivariant, and not right. Uh, it's my definition. F at T. Uh, professor, mm -hmm. I think there's something wrong with the definition of push forward. I think T mu of E should be equal to mu T inverse of E in order to satisfy the associativity of group action. Uh, okay, so maybe I'm defining uh, something. There's uh, an inverse messed up somewhere. Let's Let's check this. So uh, I claim that T mu of E should be mu of, uh, I see, so this should be mu of T inverse of E. Of course, because um, uh, it's a push forward, so T is a mapping from x to y, and this should be in y. So yes, of course, it should be t inverse here. Uh, so this is this is the definition of the push forward. You do this stuff, and then you forget it uh, where the inverses go. So that's this is the definition of push forward here. 
And because of this, this then gives the relationship, and this is what I need, that the integral, so I was right before when I thought I forgot the inverse, the integral of f compose t inverse d mu is equal to the integral of f d t inverse mu. So you don't switch the inverse on this formula, right? So this is what we get. So therefore, this, what I got here, this should be just a t. All right, so hopefully we're all happy with that. Uh, so then it's left equivariant, and now things match up right, because now here this is ts. OK. And now if we look at a difference, look at this function, which is a difference, and apply it to t, we see we get exactly the integral of f dt uh, uh, s mu minus uh, d, well, no, minus t mu. And what do we know about this? We know that as t goes to infinity, this goes to zero. So in other words, this is a C0 function, right? So we see that therefore, phi of f satisfies the property that when you take the right translate and look at the difference, it is a C0 function. So this is exactly in this set A that we defined. So, uh, so the range is in A. Uh, OK, and then uh, the other thing about this map is it's obviously linear and, uh, and it's obviously positive. It takes positive functions to positive functions. Uh, in fact, since the range is abelian, it's even completely positive. Uh, but in particular, if you have a state on the range, which the range is in A, if you have a state on A, then you can pull it back and get a state on CK, right? So if we have that uh, some C is a left invariant state, right, so which we're assuming because gamma is not properly proximal. Uh, so then we see that composing this uh, is a uh, gamma invariant state on C of K. But of course, Reese representation theorem then therefore says you have an invariant measure. So Reese representation theorem gives a gamma invariant measure on K. All right, so that finishes uh, this proof. So convergence groups are all always properly proximal. Uh, the other thing I mentioned is, of course, amenable groups are never pro properly proximal because every action on a compact house door space by an amenable group has an invariant measure. Uh, but also, inner amenable groups are never properly proximal. So here's another theorem. That is that if gamma is inner amenable, so then gamma is not properly proximal. And it's a similar uh, proof uh, that we're going to, to give. Here we showed that the convergence action, we had this natural way, we had this natural UCP map um, embedding C of K into L infinity of gamma into this A, which was equivariant. For here, we're going to embed this A into some other space and then again, pull back a mean. So we're gonna, again, suppose, uh, so the proof, suppose uh, L infinity of gamma has a conjugation invariant mean, uh, so a conjugation invariant state. Such that, uh, let's call it phi, such that phi restricted to C naught of gamma 
say identically zero. So that was our definition of inner amenability. And then what do I know? Well, this C star algebra A actually lives inside of L infinity. And here we have a state on L infinity, so I can just take the restriction. Right? So then B restricted to A gives a state on A. And if we have uh, T in gamma and F in A, so then we can look at what is a phi of left translate minus phi of uh, F. And now we see here uh, that uh, this is, the state phi is conjugation invariant. So here is the left action of T, but we could also write that as RT LT and then we use invariance, so this is the same as V of uh, R, T, R T inverse, F minus V of F. Maybe I can put everything inside the parentheses. Because it's conjugation invariant, so all I did was replace F with R T, R T inverse F and then use the fact that phi is conjugation invariant. Uh, but now what do we have? We have that this, because it's F was in A, this is in C0 of gamma. And we know that phi restricted to C0, C0 of gamma is identically zero, so this is zero. Uh, so therefore, restricting this state to A is left invariant. So it gives a left invariant state on this, this C star algebra A. All right, so that's, uh, so these are two results about proper proximality. Um, we'll prove more groups are properly approximable. We'll also discuss more convergence groups. So, so far all we have are um, our uh, SL2, the discrete subgroups of SL2R, non-amenable non discrete subgroups of SL2R. Uh, but we'll discuss more examples uh, next time uh, when we talk about hyperbolic groups. Uh, the last thing I want to do is give one more characterization of proper proximality. And so you notice how we showed convergence groups are properly proximal. Uh, so the theorem was as follows. So we look at this argument and the key property we needed was that um, we had an action on a, uh, on a compact house door space, and we had a measure on this compact house door space, which satisfied this property that, um, that uh, T mu, where is it right here, that T times S mu minus T mu goes to zero weak star for any S. So this is what we actually proved. So uh, now let me make this as a theorem that gamma is that the converse is also also true. Converse uh, gamma is properly proximal. Well, if and only if uh, there exists some action of gamma on K compact Hausdorff, so an action by homeomorphisms, uh, and there exists some measure. Uh, so such that where there's no invariant measure, so such that this action has no invariant measure, and uh, such that there exists some measure, mu probability measure on K, which satisfies this proper proximality condition. such that the limit as t goes to infinity of t mu minus 
ts mu, so this is a weak star limit, is equal to zero for all s m. So in fact, this example we gave uh, from convergence groups is in some sense generic in, in that that's the only way you can prove something's properly proximal. So if you have your favorite group, you want to prove it's properly proximal, uh, of course, trying to show that there doesn't exist some state on this, you know, strange C-star algebra, it might be hopeless. So instead, you try to look for actions of the group on compact house store space, and you try to find these particular uh, measures, these like convergence-like measures. So the proof. So like I said, we gave one this direction we already gave. Let's see. We proved before. So it's just this direction that we need to prove. And this is because we have, remember this C star algebra A, which was a set of F and L infinity of gamma, such that F minus the right translates by T of F is C naught. This is for all T in gamma. And proper proximality was the same as not having a, an invariant state on this. And so what we're going to do is we're just going to take the spectrum of the C star algebra. This is a commutative uh, C star algebra. So we're going to set uh, delta sub gamma to be the spectrum of this commutative, the Gelfand spectrum of this commutative C star algebra. And note that, uh, so set this equal to this, uh, so that Uh, A can be identified naturally with continuous functions on this space. So this is a natural compact Hausdorff space. Uh, so since gamma acts on A, gamma is going to also act on the spectrum. So we have a natural action of gamma on this space by homeomorphisms. Uh, so just coming from the action on, on A. Uh, and then the other thing we have is notice that this A contains C naught. So also we have that C naught of gamma is contained in A. So therefore there's some elements of the spectrum you can compute explicitly, like mainly point evaluation. So point evaluation is certainly a natural uh, one-dimensional homomorphism from A. So we get, therefore, we get this embedding. Uh, so we have C naught in A, and hence, we get this embedding of uh, gamma into this space. Uh, so that this space is, uh, and this is a dense, uh, uh, this will be a dense embedding. Uh, This is a dense embedding because, of course, if you have a function which is zero at every element of the ga group gamma, then that's a zero function. So this is a dense, has dense range. So this delta gamma is actually a compactification of the group gamma. Uh, it's a compact Hausdorff space such that gamma is embedded densely uh, as a dense open subset. Uh, so this is a compact, uh, what's often called a compactification of the group. Uh, and this compactification is particularly, particularly nice. Uh, so this was first studied in the setting of operator algebras by Ozawa, uh, in that you have this following, maybe let me write it as a lemma, uh, you have this following property that if we take any uh, sequence Tn and gamma such that Tn, or I should say net here maybe, uh, Tn converges to some point uh, which is in the boundary. So then for all S and gamma, we have that Tn converge at Tn times S. So if we multiply by S on the right, so if we multiply by S on the left, then we know that we just converge to S times omega. This is just the equivariance condition. But uh, this compactification has the property that if we multiply by S on the right, then this converges to omega also. So 
this is what Ozawa called, so i.e. this compactification is uh, small at infinity. That's what Ozawa called this property. Uh, so let's go ahead and prove the lemma. So the proof of the lemma. Well, let's suppose that it didn't converge uh, to omega, so suppose not. Suppose not, uh, and take a subnet, say, and take a subnet such that T, TNS converge to some other point, omega tilde, not equal to omega. All right, so what does this mean? This means that there's some continuous function which separates these two points, because any compact Hausdorff space, any two points, there's a continuous function which is different than one. So we can take F, a continuous function on this space, uh, such that, um, Uh, so such that f at omega is not equal to f at omega tilde. And remember this we're identifying with a. So f is an element of, of a. Uh, okay, but then let's look at what is, uh, what is this. But notice that f is continuous so that f at omega is the limit as n goes to infinity of f at tn, whereas f at omega tilde is the limit as n goes to infinity of f at tn s, but that's just right translation by s of f of tn. Where now I'm viewing a as a sub algebra of L infinity, right? So I can view F under this isomorphism, I can view F as a function on L infinity. Uh, and then what do we have? Well, therefore the difference here, F omega minus F omega tilde is the limit as N goes to infinity of F minus RS F evaluated at TN, but this, again, is a compact function, a C0 function, so this is zero since Tn is an infinite sequence. It's infinite because it converges to something on the boundary. Uh, so this would be a contradiction. So that kind of finishes. Uh, oh, so that doesn't finish the proof, that finishes the lemma. Uh, so given the lemma, and now we can finish the proof with the lemma. So what does this say in particular? This says that uh, therefore, if we set mu to be the Dirac function at the identity, which is certainly a nice probability measure on this compact house store space, then this has the property that, uh, that we require. So then uh, mu, so Tn minus and S mu converges to zero uh, weak star whenever N TN is any infinite sequence of the group. Um, why is that? Because again, by taking a subsequence, you get that this converges to omega and right, this converges to omega tilde, the TNS. Okay, uh, so that exactly shows that there exists such a measure and then finally, the thing to notice is that uh, there, so um, there exists a gamma invariant probability measure on delta gamma, if and only if there exists a gamma invariant state on A.
of course, since it's just the spectrum, so A is continuous functions, that's again just the Reese representation thing. Uh, so that then finishes, finishes the proof. Uh, so proper proximality is really something you should look for actions, you should look for natural actions, uh, but there are a few exceptions um, where I don't know where nat natural actions are, and we'll discuss this either on Friday or Monday, uh, so we're going to show that uh, free groups, if we take a free group and then direct product to free group, or actually proper proximality in general, are closed under direct products. So this is properly pro proximal. So we'll prove this. So we will. So we'll prove this. So the question is, uh, what is the natural action? Uh, what is action? And I don't know. Uh, so the proof we'll give it will be very C star algebraic uh, operator algebra heavy. Uh, we're gonna and we'll prove some abstract, um, you know, Han Bonnach type theorems. So we're gonna give a purely existence or non-existence result of for invariant states. Uh, so it should be that for this group, it's such a simple and natural group, there should be a natural action together with a probability measure, you know, but I, I don't know what that natural action is. So this is something that's a bit curious. Uh, anyway, we'll stop here and we'll, we'll probably not get to this on Friday, but on Monday, because on Friday, I think I'll talk about hyperbolic groups. So they're, they're also going to be properly possible. Any questions? Oh, yes, I have two questions. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, do, when you define convergence action, uh, do, you so, do you specify the behavior of point A? No, I don't. In fact, that's why I, I was hesitant uh, for a moment there. No, I, I don't specify the, the behavior of point A. Uh, of course, by passing to a sum subsequence, uh, you can assume that A converges uh, to some point. But that point could also be B, for instance. Okay, thank you. And the second question is, uh, I wonder the, uh, the existence of the probability measure without atoms, but it, does it uh, automatically, uh, you know, uh, can we prove from the definition of convergence group that uh, the... Yeah, you can show the, that. Uh, so ev every compact, every infinite compact, so K has to, K, if you have a convergence action, then clearly the compact house space is infinite. Okay. Um, and you can prove that every infinite compact house space, there exists a probability measure without atoms. Uh, how about the how about the uh, one-point compactification? Uh, okay, yeah, yeah, no, you're right. I should be more careful. So you can prove, so if you're, the compact, yeah, this is a lemma in our paper. So the, com the compact Hausdorff space uh, will not just be uh, infinite, but it'll, it'll have to be uncountable. If it's countable, you can rule this out. Uh, and you can't have a convergence section on a countable set with, without a probability measure. Uh, so K will be uncountable. And then you can prove a lemma, which shows that for any uncountable compact house space, there exists a measure without atoms. Okay. And this is just because there's some general uh, theory that say every uh, compact house space is a quotient of uh, this Hilbert cube. And then you can take a measure there, uh, you can take a product measure there and you can make sure that this quotient map doesn't send you to any atoms. Uh, so this is possible, yeah, but I don't want to present this in the class, but uh, you can look this up in, in my paper. By the way, this notion of proper proximality, uh, this was a notion uh, introduced uh, uh, three, I guess, two and a half years ago. So this is 2018 by uh, Remy Boutinet, uh, Adrian Ioana, and myself. Uh, so you can look at the paper for that lemma. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, so for confirmation, so 
from the definition of convergence group, uh, we can prove that the compact Hausdorff space is uncountable. Yes, from the definition of a convergence group, uh, you can show that the compact Hausdorff space has to be uncountable. Okay. And then once you have that, then you can produce a, a measure on it without atoms. Mm -hmm. I see. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions? I was trying to hide that under the rug, but uh, you called me out. All right. Okay. I, in that case, I'll see you guys on Friday.